Today we're going to talk about uh, wilderness experiences. And, and honestly, the, the, the season that I've just come out of, it's been a truly humbling experience. And I'm sharing this from a, you know, I'm being open, I'm being uh, transparent here. It was really, it was really humbling. Before I went into this season that I was in, I really thought that I was it. I was, I, I was it. I had it all figured out. I was, you know, Mr. Know-it-all. I was all that. And, you know, I, I thought that, you know, hey, I've been to Africa. You know, I, I've, I've, I've done this. I've done that. And listen to me and look at me here and all that. And if you look at it from God's perspective, I'm not surprised God probably, you know, if you look at God's perspective, I had it coming. I needed that to humble me a little bit. And I'm being really honest and you can laugh and it's, you know, it's funny and all that. But for real, I needed it. I'm not saying that God, uh, uh, that there was God that put me in that situation. It wasn't. But, you know, when the devil has plans to attack us and stuff, because the devil truly tried to destroy me and destroy us. He couldn't destroy us. God wouldn't let him destroy us and when he can't destroy you he will try to delay you when he can't delay you he will try to distract you when he can't distract you he'll try to discourage you so I was delayed distracted and discouraged but not destroyed hallelujah here we are today hallelujah praise God and I've been waiting to say this actually I've been waiting to say this and I want to say it to the whole world and I want to speak into the spirit realm right now and say, devil, you should have taken me down when you had your shot because we're coming for you with the fire of God. We're coming for you. You're going to pay for every single day that you have stolen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been envisioning saying that for like two and a half years. <laughs> Some of you that I talk to frequently, you've already heard me say that many times. But now I said it from the stage and it felt really good. <laughs> I'm, I'm very serious. When I say that the devil will try to destroy you, when he can't, he will delay, distract or discourage you. And that's what we went through. And it was a humbling experience. God allowed it. He said, this boy, it's good for you. To know what you're preaching about. Because I, I, I was pre, I, I, you know, I could preach a little bit, you know, I, I could make people feel a little bit like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't know what I was preaching about. I've never faced it before. One of my favorite sermons that I used to preach is when I talk about stepping out of the boat. Taking a step of faith out on the water. And I had never been in a storm before. The disciples of Jesus... When Peter needed to take a step of faith, he was in the middle of a storm. And it hits different to say it when you have experienced storms. It hits different. The scripture that says the name of the Lord is a strong tower when you have felt unsafe before. The Bible verse that says, I know the plans I have for you. It hits differently when you have felt hopeless and helpless. It hits differently when you have gone through it. So now, I mean, I'm not in any way fully, you know, I'll probably go through things still in my life, but at least I know what it means to go through wilderness. Anyway, it's not easy. It's not easy. Praise God. And, 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 and uh, the humbling part of the experience is I realize that I'm, I'm not special. I'm not special. I'm just an average guy. But Jesus Christ loves average people. Jesus loves average people with average problems and average marriages and average houses and average work and average everything. There's one thing that isn't average though and that's our God. Our God is everything but average. So if you're feeling average here today, maybe you're an average Joe like me. Jesus Christ wants to use you. You don't need a special gift to be able to be used by God. You don't need a special talent. You need to be nothing special for God to use you. He's looking for average people. Jesus Christ called 12 average, very carnally minded people that were straight out stupid many times. 
when he chose the people that would shake and change this world. So if you're feeling average today, don't be discouraged. Let it be an encouragement that God is calling you, average Joe. He is calling you today. He wants to use you, and that's all he needs. He needs an average Joe. I had some numbers, and I'll say it just for fun. If you are an average Joe and you, you're making between 33 and 39 a year, you live in 2,200 square feet, you have 1.15 kids and 1.88 cars, you're the average Joe that Jesus is looking for. You have a dog named Max or a dog named Bella, Jesus is calling you today. You're the average American person. And that's what he's looking for. He's not looking for, for special people. He's looking for average people like you and me. Praise God. And average people go through wilderness as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The title of today's message is Deserts and Gardens. Deserts and Gardens. Praise God. Um, you can follow me to the book of Joshua. How many know what it means like to go through wilderness? You know the meaning, like going through wilderness. You're well acquainted with it. Can I see it again? How many have gone through a very serious wilderness in your life? How many are going through wilderness right now? I mean, don't be ashamed. Going through wilderness is nothing to be ashamed of. I'm literally, I mean, I'm on the, you know, right two days ago, I came out of my metaphorical wilderness. And this is how we look like. This is a person fresh off the wilderness boat, you know. Praise God. So, uh, um, the dictionary definition, it's not a dictionary definition, but it's a Christian resource that defines the Christian terms. It says that a wilderness experience is a locale for intense experiences of stark need for food and water, of isolation like Elijah, of danger and divine deliverance like Hagar and Ishmael, of renewals and encounters with God like Moses, and there's a psychology as well as a geography of wilderness, a theology gained in the wilderness. And something I can say is that wilderness experiences oftentimes comes right before or right after life-changing events or promotions. I mean, I'm going to mention it. Uh, we used to say the joke in the pastoral chat when it first happened, but I was ordained as a pastor and then literally on, on like Sunday, it was like Sunday I was on day and I was a pastor and like Tuesday was when I was not allowed back into the country and when my wilderness experience started. So I never even came to the church with the title. So the joke was, oh man, dude, you really want that title. That's what he was here for, you know, took the title and ran with it. So many times that's how it is, right around very important events in your life. Great promotions, either before or after, is when you face that wilderness. Something that we kind of see. God will like allow it to see, to test your metal, to see if you are ready and you're able to carry the promotion that is coming your way. And that is it. When, when I grew up in Swedish Pentecostal church, uh, the elders in the church, they are very God-loving people, God-fearing people. And, and, and I don't know if you have this in American culture, or maybe some of us that are from... European countries we can identify, but Swedish Pentecostal church, when you had the young people that were on fire for God, you know, the, the newly saved, newly converted, and they love Jesus, and they sing loud, and they raise their hands, and they dance a little, and they shout hallelujah, and the elders would be like, oh wow, I can see the passion in you, I feel the fire burning in your heart, I can see myself, I just want to let you know, get ready, because the wilderness is coming for you too, you'll go through your wilderness too, don't you worry. <laughs> it's, it's like oh wow thank you for this wonderful prophetic encouragement I feel so edified by these elders you know these are the desert dwellers they, they have found their comfort in living in the wilderness they have no plans of moving out they're there permanently and they want to encourage people you know hey it's coming for you too get ready it's coming for you too so we are not desert dwellers here that's not my purpose of, of telling you either but I want to let you know that many of us in fact, all Christians go through wilderness, but there are two different kinds of wilderness. Not everyone goes through the desert type of a wilderness, but I believe that everyone goes through the garden type of a wilderness. Two different wildernesses. I'm going to read from the book of Joshua, chapter 5, to define the first wilderness. 
Joshua chapter 5, verse 6. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, till all the people who were men of war, who came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers, that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. This was the only wilderness experience that I was aware of from the beginning. It's the desert. It's caused by, you know, it's, it's a prolonged season of, you know, sand and all that good stuff. And, and if you uh, go to Israel and the surrounding areas and you've actually gone to the desert that the people of Israel was in, with, if you ride a camel, because you can't take a car through the desert, it takes about a day and a half to go through that desert. So for the people of Israel to confusedly be walking around in that desert for 40 years, it's literally a miracle. It's like if you would go out here, get your car, and it would take you half a day to find your way out of the parking lot. It's literally impossible. It requires God not allowing you to come out of that desert experience because of their pride, because of their disobedience, and because of their rebellion against God. But then we have the other type of wilderness experience, the one that all of us, if you haven't yet, it's coming. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm just joking, but, but it might be, you know, I might be able to prepare you if you haven't faced anything of such sort yet. And it's from the book of Luke chapter 22. This is the second type of wilderness experience. Luke 22, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, and as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from you, from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood, falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and he came to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Two types of wilderness. One was a wild desert. One was a wild garden. And I've got a couple of points now on how you can identify. If you're going through a wilderness experience in your life today, I hope that this message will help you to be able to see clearly if you're in the desert or if you're in the garden. Okay, point number one. One of these wilderness experiences was self-inflicted. It was because of rebellion it was because of disobedient, and what happened was it became a punishment. The other was inevitable. There was nothing that could change the fact that it was going to happen. One was a punishment, one was a test. What is your wilderness today? Is your wilderness a punishment, or is it a test? Just like the, peop just like the three Hebrew men in um, Daniel chapter 3. The three Hebrew men, it was inevitable for them that they would go through this test. The, the fiery furnace was not a punishment, not from God, it was from man. And God can use man to put you into a garden. God uses man many times to put you in through situations. So these, these three Hebrew men, it was inevitable. Sooner or later, they were going to have to say no or they were going to have to bow their knee. And they chose to say no, and there was an instant test. I think, metaphorically speaking, that the fiery furnace was the garden of the three Hebrew men. Yeah. It was inevitable. It wasn't self-inflicted. It would have happened no matter what, because they had their faith, and they said, no, we're not going to follow Jesus, and consequences followed. Number two, in one of the wilderness experiences... God wanted the people to learn a lesson. In the second one, they needed to keep their focus. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was no lesson for him to learn there. When Daniel was in the lion's den, there was no lesson for him to learn to get out of the lion's den. 
I believe that the lion's den was Daniel's metaphorical garden, wilderness experience. He wasn't there because he had been disobedient to God and he wasn't there to learn a lesson. What lesson could he have possibly been learning in the lion's den? How to tame lions or what? There was no lesson. Not, you learn lessons when you go through wilderness, no matter what. But the purpose of it isn't a lesson. When you go through a garden, the purpose of it is to keep your focus. You don't need to learn a lesson at this point if you uh, uh, read about Jesus in the book of Matthew 4. When he was taken into the desert and the devil was tempting him. He wasn't there to learn a lesson. He was there to keep his focus. The longer he kept his focus, the more successfully he passed through the garden. Remember the garden is something you pass through. It's not something that you live in. Don't be a desert dweller nor be a garden dweller. We're passing through it. We're not staying there. Jesus passed through the desert and he was tempted, but he kept his focus. And because of that, he moved on. In deserts, you need to learn your lesson. But in the garden, you need to keep your focus. Where are you today? And tr I'm talking from experience. We were asking God, fasting and praying, seeking the face. Sure, someone is like, oh yeah, you were fasting? Okay. <laughs> God will forgive you. God will forgive you. I know there was someone because I thought the thought and it's like I heard someone was like, oh, you were fasting. Huh? Okay. Huh? Okay. We were fasting. We were praying. We were seeking the face of God. And we were, we were asking God, what is the lesson you want us to learn here? I mean, if you look at it from a practical point of view, the lesson is basically, you know, don't do anything that you're not allowed to do on a visa you know that's the lesson oh wow thank god for that lesson you know that was that was a good lesson for life you know Whew. we weren't there necessarily for a lesson because we were praying we were seeking the face of god but god wasn't answering and saying oh this is the lesson i want you to learn and when you learn this lesson be faithful in little then you will go through and i will let you out no what we were there for was to keep our focus to not allow anything to distract us from following what we have our eyes on, which is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Step number three, the third thing that differentiates a desert from a garden. In a desert, God wanted the people of God to pray and seek Him. And God wants you to always pray. Don't misquote me here. But in the desert, God wanted people to seek Him and pray and seek His face. In a garden... Jesus already prayed and sought the face of God. Jesus already tried to get an answer from God, but seemingly there was no answer. Seemingly. Yet God always sends his comforter. In the book of Psalm 23, God gave us two promises when it, when it talks about the valley of the shadow of death. Promise number one, he will guide you through it. Promise number two, he will protect you and comfort you in the midst of it. Those are the two promises. Those are the two promises. So when you're praying and you're seeking the face of God, many times he has already told you, I will see you through, trust me only. Something that I realized, something that I realized when I was in this season is that sometimes we try too much. And what we need to do instead is to trust. You try, you try, you try, and all you need to do is to trust. In the valley of the shadow of death, it says nothing about trying. It talks only about trusting. You can't lift yourself out by yourself, out of the lion's den. Trust that God knows what he's doing in the midst of it. So, God, uh, Jesus Christ was praying. We, in our situation, we were praying. We didn't get that answer that we wanted. The answer we wanted was basically, oh, you know, if you forgive the sins that someone had done to you for many years ago and you, you live a better and holier life and, and you, you, you watch less Netflix and you pray and fast more and you don't do anything else, then I will fast forward this situation for you. But it wasn't about that. It wasn't about that. But God sent his comfort. Yeah. 
always. The three Hebrew men in the fiery furnace, there was a fourth man there to comfort them. In the lion's den, God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions and to comfort Daniel. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, the Bible says angels came and ministered to him and comforted him. When Jesus was in the desert in Matthew 4, angels came and ministered to him there too. He will comfort you, but he might not answer the way that you want him to. Hallelujah. Step number four. Deserts can be shortened. Gardens can't. You cannot shorten the garden experience. You have to endure till the end. In the desert, if the people of God would have turned away from their idol worship and they would have finally embraced God and followed His law, the situation would have turned around. But in the garden, Jesus had to go through it till the end. When Daniel was in the lion's den, he prayed. I, tr I mean, he doesn't say it, but I'm pretty sure he was praying, right? In the lion's den. It would be weird if he didn't. He was praying, he was fasting. And if I was the one, I, I would have probably urinated myself too. Face to face with lions. If you read it, it actually says that when the, when the, uh, the people, that his accusers, when they were thrown into the lion's den, the lions devoured them before they even landed. Literally mid-air, the lions took them. Imagine being in that, I don't know, you can read it. Imagine being in that situation. And you are praying, God, God, you know, they put the stone over and everything and you don't even know what time it is. You're praying, God, please save me right now. I'll do anything. I'll increase my time to 20%. 30 even, God. 30, okay, 35 even. Come on, God. I'll do this, I'll fast every Monday. I'll do three-day fasting every month. Seven-day fasting once a year or 40 days fasting, whatever, you know. There was nothing Daniel could do to shorten his encounter in the lion's den. If you're going through a garden, you got to endure till the end. And why is that? Because of point five. Point five. In, in, uh, in, the, gar in, in uh, the garden, when Jesus was in the garden praying and he was sweating blood, there was a reason bigger than himself. When you are going through a garden, it's because there is a purpose greater than yourself. You're not just there to learn to change a way of life like they did in the desert. They needed to change something, change their approach, change their attitude. But when you're going through a garden, it's because there is a purpose greater than yourself. Because Daniel went through the lion's den, that is why God became the God of that nation. After that, there was great turnaround in that country because of the lion's den. When he was there, do you think he knew that? Do you think if he prayed, the God was like, oh yeah, you're going to survive this. And when you survive, the whole country is going to love me. And that's why I'm putting you through this right now. No! All he needed to do was to trust. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Because there was a purpose greater than himself. Yeah. Something great is coming after. But the desert wasn't, that wasn't how it was. They were there to learn something, change something, grow. So what are you going through today? These five points, hopefully you will be able to see if you're going through a desert or if you're going through a garden. I'm going to start rounding up this message here right now. We're going to take some time to minister here at the end. Maybe you're here today and you feel like, oh, I'm probably going through a desert after all. I mean, considering what you've said, it fits me. People go through deserts. Don't get me wrong. People go through deserts. You know, people, I've heard many people say, you know, you, you commit a crime, you get punished for it, and you say it's your garden or your wilderness experience. Like, bro, this one is on you. God is not doing this for you to, you know, a greater purpose or whatever. God can turn it around, but you caused it, okay, mister or missus? 
So it's important to understand the difference between a desert and a garden. And if you are here today and you feel like you're going through a desert, in a little bit we're going to pray with you. And if you're here today and you feel like you're going through a garden, maybe you're still in the middle of it. We're going to pray for you in just a minute. I want to round up with this. The book of Isaiah chapter 10. Let me see if I can find it quickly. There are five stages that people go through. The five stages or the five phases of loss or grief. I didn't grieve during my wilderness, but I think that it's definitely five stages of wilderness too. And I'm going to share it with you. The number one stage that you go through when you are in a garden, it's stage number one, denial. I was going through that. Me and Brittany, for a long time, we refused to accept reality. And many times when life hits you really hard and you come into a situation that you can't even believe, like, where did this come from? It's very hard to accept that reality. Maybe you are facing denial today and you're like, nope, that's, that, it's not, no, nope, that's not real. You got a, you, the doctor told you that you got a terminal disease and you're like, nope, no, nope, that's not me, not happening, not today. It's so hard to, to believe and understand and, and accept the reality that we live in denial. Is that you today? We want to pray with you in just a minute. Stage number one, denial. Stage number two, Anger. <sighs> Stage number two, that's, that's mine. I'm telling you right now, that's the one that I struggle with the most. I was angry. I'm not going to lie. I was angry. I was angry with the immigration officer. I was angry with the government of the United States. I was angry with Biden. I was angry with the police. I was angry with the political system. I was angry with Sweden. I was angry with COVID. I was angry with masks. I was at times angry with my wife. She forgave me and loved me even more. I was angry. If I've ever talked to you at some point these last three years, I've probably been angry at you. And you wouldn't even know me. And I'm like, why? So for me, stage two, anger, every stage had a part of, of stage two for me. I was in denial and anger. I was in anger. And then stage three is bargaining. And I was bargaining with anger. <laughs> and, and that was something that I had to face with God. The, the, it's not a sin to get angry. It's a sin when you act out of anger. Okay? So if you have emotions and you, don't, you are not always perfectly emotionally stable, God cannot overlook that. People that his average Joe disciples, they weren't all emotionally stable at all times. They called him a ghost. They rebuked him to his face. They were people that literally he said like, you know, my word is going to fill you. And, and they're like, well, we don't have bread. He's like, geez, guys, <laughs> literally. I'm talking about word, not bread, guys. Come on. Okay, they were so average. So, anger. It's part of it. I was angry at so many things. My wife can testify. But after that comes next stage. And, and we went through that stage too. And actually Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went through two of the five stages too. It's the, it's the two most important stages. Stage number three, which is bargaining. We started bargaining with God. Oh my, have I bargained with God. God, I will never take a, a paid salary again. Just let me come home. I will work for you for free for the rest of my life, Lord. I will do, I will, God, I will, whatever it is, God, please, please, just let me get through this. And the same with Jesus in the garden, not like that. That was, you know, very, very, uh, that's not how Jesus, Jesus said, let this cup pass me by. He was bargaining with God. But once again, it seemed like God didn't answer, yet God comforted him. The reason why God didn't answer the prayer of Jesus is because Jesus added, not my will, but your will be done. God, please let me get through this. Not my will though, let your will be done. And we begin to bargain with God. We begin to ask and pray and say, we'll do this, we'll be better, we won't do it again. And still, 
And that's the stage that separates the deserts from the gardens. People that go through deserts, they never, they never pass stage three. Because at stage three, God comes in. He's like, oh yeah? You're going to behave? Okay, let's move on. You're going to do the right thing? You're going to stop doing those things? Let's move on. But in the garden, bargaining is only the third. Number four, depression. Number four, depression. I went through depression. I struggled with it. I refused to accept it, but it was heavy. Maybe you are going through that today. Let me tell you something. That you are feeling depressed, that you are feeling anxiety, it doesn't mean that there is an absence of faith. That you're feeling anxious today, depressed, or you're having feelings of feeling down, doesn't mean that there is no faith there. Don't be ashamed because you have feelings. Don't be ashamed because life hits you hard. It's okay. You still have faith. Even though you don't feel like it, your faith is there. Even though you don't feel the presence of Jesus, He is still your Lord. He loves you. He wants to be your friend no matter what. Whether you feel it or not, He is right there. Hallelujah. 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 The presence of anxiety doesn't mean the absence of faith. The presence of depression doesn't mean the absence of faith. Hallelujah. So you go through that depression. And me personally, I would never, when I'm in the midst of it, I would never tell anyone. No. You know why? Because I thought I got it together. What are people going to think if I actually say that I'm not doing good? I'm not doing good. Aren't you a pastor? Aren't you? Isn't your faith so strong? Why are you feeling down? Yeah, it happens. Life hits you. But the best thing is that you get back up. You can't get back up if you were never down. You can't get back up if you were never struck down. And that leads me to stage number five. And this is the one that defines it all. Jesus went through this stage two in the garden. Stage number five after depression is acceptance. You accept the facts of your situation. This family member is gone. I'm accepting it. They're gone. I, this child that I had in me, it's never gonna come back. It's gone. It's in heaven. And you accept it. The situation that I'm facing, it is what it is. And when you come to the point of accepting your lion's den, when you come to the point of accepting your fiery furnace, when you come to the point like Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, sweating blood because he was so anxious, and he stood up and he said, God, I accept the outcome. It was not until he did that that God could transform that situation and he became the savior of mankind. Jesus Christ, when you accept the situation, he will come in and he will say, my daughter and my son, I never needed you to be strong. I never needed you to be perfect. I just needed you. The moment that you accept the hardship, you accept it and you say, you know what? It's not gonna change right now. I'm not gonna get my child back. I'm not gonna get my parent back. I'm not gonna, this situation isn't gonna turn around. This heartbreak, it's not gonna change. They're not going to come back tomorrow and say, I'm sorry, and they want to get back together. And you begin to accept the garden that you're going through. That's when this Bible verse comes to pass from the book of Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. It shall come to pass in that day that his, your burden will be taken away from your shoulder and your yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. 
because he will never leave me nor forsake me. I accept it. God save me. Maybe that's you today. I want to help you. We're going to pray so that you can come to the point of acceptance. Because at that point, when we are here, that's when God, He can build you up like never before. If you have never been broken, how will He build you back stronger? Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to hungrygen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.